Amber, thank you so much for joining us today. We are big fans of you, your content, your show, everything. Um, a little about Amber for those who don't know. She is a writer, executive producer, and host of The Amber Ruffin Show on Peacock. Her show just got a Writer's Guild nomination, and she's a New York Times bestselling author. And my favorite, Amber was also the first Black female to write for a late night network talk show in the U.S. The first. Kind of. I think the first was Wanda Sykes. I'm going to have to talk to some adults about it because I thought her show was on Showtime. I've always thought that. But it was on Fox. So Did I, I, think I just made you tell a lie, but we'll see. Oh my God, you sent me up for some actual fake news there. Yay! All right. To me, to, me, <laughs> to me, Amber is the first, and for this conversation, she is. I'm sorry, Wanda, or we'll call you like 1.5. Yay! Right? That's kind of nice. You guys could share it. Um, so, Amber, how did you become the first or 1.5? You started in stand up in Omaha. So, bring us back there to tell us how you became you. Um, I, in Omaha, Nebraska, I would improvise I was a part of an improv troupe and I just couldn't stop I loved it I still almost love it um but I was an improviser for years and years and years and we would go to Chicago for the improv festival you know where there's real a real improv community and then when I went there, they were like, you need to move here and you will have a full-time job improvising, I guarantee it. And then I moved there and in a minute, I got a full-time job in Amsterdam because I auditioned for it in Chicago, moved to Amsterdam, did a theater called Boom Chicago, which is kind of like the second city, but loud and crazy. And we did that for two years. Mm -hmm. moved to called the second city and was like can I have a job and they were like okay move to Denver so I moved to Denver and did a show there then I got main stage Chicago so I went to Chicago then I went back to boom Chicago in Amsterdam because it was too fun and then I moved to LA to make it um and that was just the worst and then I got this job and I live in New York City Woohoo! um I just want to point out when you put your hand up the background of your screen turned the same color as your nail polish for half a second. I don't know. How, oh, there. Oh, my God. Yay. This is like that James Cameron Blue movie. I don't remember. <laughs> you nerd. <laughs> um, so how did you end up on Seth Meyers? Uh, first as the writer, then as non-camera talent. Um, were you discovered in some way? I auditioned for SNL. and that was at the same time that Seth was leaving SNL to do Late Night with Seth Meyers. Now, Seth Meyers, I knew from Boom Chicago in Amsterdam because that's a theater he is an alum of. So every year he would come and visit and see the show and hang out and blah. So I knew him. So I auditioned for SNL and was like, I am definitely getting it. I've got this. I'm just, I don't know why I thought that, but I 100%. 100% that I was going to get it then didn't had three days where I was like I'm going to die here in LA this is horrible and then Seth called and was like do you want to work on my show and I was like you have a show and then I was like yes and then I moved out here and the rest is history. history so that is the best worst audition that you've had truly um yes, it was good I'm not crazy. It was a good, a good audition. They probably regret not hiring you. Like if we were to ask them today, I think so. Let's go with that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so question, um, what did you learn from working uh, with Seth on his show? Um, and what, did, what are you carrying to your show that you've learned from there? And then I want to talk about, you know, what you're doing differently. We learn at late night to write for yourself to just like do the thing you feel like doing you know and I made sure to tell everyone I hired for the Amber Ruffin show that like I hired you because I want to say the things you say so you sit down and write 
um, exactly what you feel like writing and we'll change the pronouns if necessary. And I'll say exactly that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I want you exactly where you are, exactly your stuff. Um, but that took a long time to learn at Late Night Seth. I just thought, well, not exactly what I would say, right? But it was, it was, it was exactly what I would say. So um, I make sure to try to tell my writers that. Also like the crew and stuff is mostly the same people because we film it in um, Seth's studio. So everyone is just so nice and kind. And another thing Seth said to us when he hired us, he was like, you know, a lot of people could do this job. I hired the people I want to be around. I hired the nicest people I know who were the most qualified for this job. And it works. Everyone is a dreamboat. Um, that so is a great I piece of advice. Job. Hire people you want to hang out with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no one is hiring the complainers or the angry people. The, those people are not working anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I like that flex, that water flex. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about diversity. You know, going back to you and Wanda Sykes being the first, I'm just working her in now. <laughs> um, you, you know, not to quote Kamala Harris, but she said, I may be the first, but I certainly will not be the last. So does that influence you in how you run your writer's room? Um, I guess maybe, look, everyone in my writer's room could head up their own franchise. Those people are stars. And it's, it's funny because you usually hire writer writers, I guess. I'm a writer performer and I, it's hard for me to be like, okay, this person is just writing and they're never gonna perform. It's hard for me to even wrap my mind around such a thing. Mm -hmm. So everyone I have, most of the people that I've hired have been like, you know, second city improv Olympic guys and um, you know, my little buds. And it's very fun, it's yeah. very cute. So something you said just reminded me, like when you first uh, got hired as a writer by Seth, um, did you have to kind of prove yourself to, to be on camera talent or did he just know right away? Did they know? Seth hired me thinking she'll be in the sketches that we do and the bits that we write and not so much as a writer, but you know, I'll also write jokes and bits and stuff. Okay. So, yeah, he certainly hired me with an eye toward performing. Okay. He had seen me perform for a bunch of years at that point. Yeah, and it would be such a waste to just keep you in a writer's room. Though no disrespect to only writers. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about how you use humor to really educate people and teach them and of course entertain them. Um, last night I watched How Did We Get Here on Black History Month and I, I think it was genius and I honestly think it should be played in every single school. Um, so my question is, does it ever get exhausting having to use humor to teach people things that I think on some level we wish they knew? Um, no, cause I don't really, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm always, my goal is to like try to un-gaslight us. So, telling us why we feel that way is a part of it. So like, you feel like you were cheated uh, out of your uh, elementary school education and you were, and here's why, you know, I'm always trying to un-gaslight you because we are so severely lied to so constantly. And it, yeah, by Trump, but you know, now that he's gone and the <laughs> friggin' Trump fog is cleared, it's like, ooh, where did his lies come from? Well, dang, where did those lies come from? Like, it really starting to unravel all of it feels good. And that piece was written by um, a guy we found on Twitter named Michael Harriet, who writes for The Root. And he is, I'll get it wrong, he is a professor in. Oh, something. He's a professor in like a complicated thing that I didn't know was a thing. <laughs> I don't want to try to say it because I'm going to lie on him. I'm, yeah, I'm not going to try it. But okay. he wrote that 
because we hired him because he writes all these crazy threads that are like, you think, uh, you know, I, I don't know, you think marriage is uh, a old concept, but it's actually new. Okay, that's a bad example. But it's just like something you thought was a fact and he turns it completely upside down. So he wrote that. And I can't say that I knew most of it, but that Daughters of the American Confederacy, that I did not know before I read it on my computer the other day. So he's certainly teaching me. I didn't go to college. So he's got some news for me. I know. I mean, I went to college. I was educated here in America and I didn't know half of that stuff. Um, two things I want to talk about. One, you should never be Michael's publicist because, <laughs> you know, does the thing with the stuff, the stuff thing, you know. <laughs> um, two, I love the term ungaslight us. Um, that is just so fantastic. And every Columbus Day, I want to just watch your video because that is a racket that day. Um, all right. So, you know, going along, I know you say that you don't get exhausted having to use humor and maybe it makes it a little more therapeutic, but um, if you could say three things right now that you wish people knew without using humor, like what would they be right now in today's world? You, even you are susceptible to crazy, you know, not necessarily QAnon conspiracies, but you know, those crazy Facebook rumors that turn into facts that kill people, even you are susceptible to that. So get out of there. <laughs> Whenever you see your friends falling by the wayside, and I mean this, abandon them. Get the fuck out <laughs> because that shit is catchy. Don't, don't get anywhere near that. Um, that would be probably like one through three, because yeah. as you watch your little friends fall for just like, and not like Pizzagate stuff, but like, well, masks are actually killing us. Like that little bit, it's everywhere. That, that stuff is dangerous. And we are all in danger of being someone's idiot. I could become someone's idiot tomorrow. You know, you know, I don't know. They say this hair grease makes you smart. So I'm gonna, I mean, probably not that, but I don't know if they make a compelling case, I might believe that. That's good. I like that. You're like, don't join a QAnon Facebook group. Get out of there. Get out, get out. If it feels uh, right, get out of there. So I, I think we can say that we all learn a lot from failure. Um, do you have a failure story that you could share with us that you've learned from? Failure story. I mean, that's an L auditions. Pretty big. That's that was a, a good big one. biff. Pretty good. Pretty good a fail. Any sort of failure since then? Since then? What? I no. mean, I, I couldn't imagine you failing. <laughs> no, me? Impossible. Um, I don't know. You know what we do? is something we kind of joke about is we say, we write for the garbage. And that's <laughs> it's kind of true. And even now I do think I was like, oh, I got my own show and nobody's saying no to me. My stuff's getting on, but, but these writers beat me all the time. Once I wrote a, um, a Halloween song, one of these children, wrote a song better than my song. I had to throw my own song in the garbage. What was like a verse from it? I'm just curious. It was monsters, monsters, monsters everywhere. Pay attention close, there are monsters everywhere. And then it would be like Frankenstein, Dracula, and um, you know, people who wear their masks down below their nose. You know, that was the bit of the whole thing. I was like- That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'm glad you got to perform it here. I got it. <laughs> Got some airtime. Yeah. Um, so your book with your sister, you'll never believe what happened to Lacey, crazy stories of racism. Yay. How did you decide to write that? I mean, I kind of know, but tell us. Well, they sent me to talk to the book guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'll talk to him. I'm not writing anything. 
so on the way there, my sister texted me and was like, you're never gonna believe this, blah, 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 blah. I was like, ooh, this is great. What if we just wrote a book of these? Um, and she was like, I don't care, knock yourself out. So I asked the guy who was like, this is the best idea. We're definitely doing this and someone's gonna buy it. And then we did and they did. And as we were pitching the idea for the book, um, the idea is uh, crazy stories of racism. My sister lives in Omaha and it's just all of the racist things that happen to her that are hilarious. Just the funny ones make an, enough for a book. So as I'm pitching this, Lacey texts and I go, I, I understand we're in a meeting, but Lacey texted and I have to know. And I picked it up and I texted, sure as shit. She had, a, um, she had made the they made the quota or met the quota or whatever for work. And most of the people who work there are black except the supervisors who are white. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we'll get you a t-shirt if you blah, blah, blah. And so they did. And so they got him a t-shirt and the t-shirt said, hashtag we winning. And Lacey said, why doesn't it say we winning? Or we are winning or we won or something. They said, it says we winning because that's how y'all talk. <laughs> they just said it. <laughs> I felt that microaggressive story coming on and I was like, oh, my body temperature is ri rising very much. <laughs> oh, those um, stories make me laugh so hard. She sent a picture with her and the, the t-shirt. We were laughing so hard. Like, oh, yeah, bud, what are you going to do? That is an amazing story. Um, do, are there any stories that didn't make it in that you wish had made it in? Um, Since then, there are stories like the one lady who... I think was the um, lady who couldn't understand why she maybe shouldn't dress her child up as Pocahontas. Mm -hmm. And she really went on and on about it and was really hurt. Um, she uh, called my sister and was like, I read your book, it's great. At first I thought I was one of the stories, but I realized I wasn't. Lisa was like, no, that's you, you did that. You did that and that, and that other story, that's you. Um, I was called Pocahontas once. Um, I oh. had my hair in braids. I was like moving and someone's like, you look just like Pocahontas. And I, and I was like, and she looked at me like, I, I like it was a compliment. And I was like, thank you. That is a, a the wrong Indian, a different type. Um, <laughs> so I feel like we both learned things that day. Um, so I want to know, will there be a sequel to the book? And my colleague says she hopes it will be called I hope by now you will believe what happened to Amber. <laughs> That's a good idea. I don't know. I'm the youngest of five. Oh. So there's three more siblings we haven't heard from. And I do have a sister, Angie, who is a pastor in um, Kenosha. Um, well, now Minneapolis, but she uh, has been a Lutheran pastor all over the Midwest in small town after small town. So I don't know how we could make that a comedy, but she sure has enough stories to fill a book. It seems like you have a series to go and yours <laughs> might be the last. And, and I think that title, I hope by now you'll believe Amber will be great. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just be one book for each kid. We really should. You should. A terrible idea. You would. I, I will, will buy all of them on oh, Kindle yeah. and hardcover. Um, so can I ask like, you know, I, I know the answer to this in some ways, but what would you say has been one of your main challenges that you've faced as a Black woman trying to make it in this industry? Is there like a specific story you could share? Challenges? I mean, people expect you to when when they realize that you are black or a minority of any kind you can't just be yourself you then have to be their idea of what blackness is you know it's a lot like I can't imagine what other people go through because it's hard when it's just black stuff and now hopefully we're all older and time's gone by and people have been publicly embarrassed to death enough to stop people from doing that but people like they want you to talk a certain way they want you to look a certain way 
and then people want you to feel the way they feel about this. People want you to validate their feelings about you. Ugh. I mean, it is a lot. So you have to put your happiness first. And that's what I've done to a horrible extent. I mean, my happiness comes before the friggin' content of my television show <laughs> comes before my uh, jobs. It comes before everything. So it's just because it's not guaranteed. And people can break you down mm -hmm. and wear you out to where you forget how to take care of yourself. But you got to be the first thing. Like, so how do you do that? How do you prioritize yourself and your happiness over your job um you got to well a lot of people think that you make sure to separate the two and then put you know e e equal time for both and that's probably true but for me i just took the things that i like and put them at work wow. and so then now i'm just a workaholic <laughs> and it feels fun you're like, I've tricked myself into working. <laughs> I don't know if it's healthy, but that's where I'm at. That's the truth. And, and it makes you happy. So I think it works. I'm pretty happy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you touched upon something that was, um, you know, putting yourself first, putting your happiness first. Have you ever had to stand up for yourself or not call anyone out? But like, have you ever had to say something that I'm sure being the only black writer in, in rooms, you've had to stand up for yourself. And, and is that scary? Um, no, I guess it would be scary. I mean, certainly not now, but I bet there was a time when it was scary. Um, but I've always done comedy. And when you do comedy, you can be like, look, you raggedy bitch. I'll drag you out back and beat you behind if you go, you know, and people go, ah, that's fun but only you and the person you were talking to know you meant it, <laughs> you know? So I guess the answer is not really, because I'll drag a person. And it's because I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and I, I saw the bad part. You ain't it, you know what I mean? You don't have it. You're not, you know, a scary cop pulling me over. You're not a group of, you know, guys in a truck with beer bottles and mullets like you ain't it you, you ain't shit so I mean yeah I just don't feel that that has happened but also because it's comedy most people are eager to learn the next thing and to ascend to these new levels of awareness with America mm -hmm. so yeah I guess it just hasn't happened. Yeah, I love that you use humor to tell the truth. I mean, it's such a great um, like weapon in, in so many ways um, or tool, I guess would be better. And compliments to your creepy wink there when you said that. <laughs> It's good, it's good. <laughs> um, so I love to do, you know, women empower women. Let's do a little shout out to your favorite black content creators, some of your comedy heroes. Um, and then I want you to shout out some people that might not be as well known that you think we need to follow their work. Here are the two next people. The two next people are Sam J. Um, who is about to have her own late night show. I'm gonna say on Showtime. That might be a lie, so I whispered it. I whisper all lies. Okay. And also Z-Way Fumido is gonna have her own show on one of those two. Okay. See, I think you can say it and then I'll put like a disclaimer that's like, oh, okay. she was lying. See Z-Way Fumido on HBO. See Sam J on Showtime um but those so it's like it's pretty cool because i get to have a late night show for me like those two people i'm their audience like a mug so i'm so excited to have to sit back and enjoy a late night show by a black woman because i don't really get to have that much fun 
with mine because I saw it already. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to do all the work to put it together. So I know it's going to happen. Uh, that's amazing. I will I will confirm what networks they're going to be on. I'm so excited. So I this video isn't just filled with you and me lying the whole time. So many lies. I'll lie on a person. I don't care. <laughs> so um, as as we established, you and Wanda Sykes were the first. Um, what's the next barrier that you want to break? Um, the next barrier I would like to break is king of the what no just kidding um i don't know i guess i would like to um just have a regular thing what is that? <laughs> i would just like to be like okay this is your regular schedule and then that's nice <laughs> It's like just one thing and not 50 things. That would be cool. I mean, I understand that's not a barrier to break, but that's where my head is at when you go, what do you want? I want that. Shoot, people are out here working one job. I have three. So you would like to be the king of the regular thing? Oh, yeah. Just one thing. <laughs> Just one job. I love how five minutes ago you were like, my happiness is that I'm a workaholic. <laughs> Just lie after lie. <laughs> um, all right, Amber, thank you so much. Our audience is going to love this. So on behalf of all of them, thank you. Um, one piece of advice you want to leave them with? Um, I guess I would say if you know you want to be a comedy writer you got to show me that work you know you have to have at least a joke a day on twitter and they don't have to be good it just has to be many i you need to have a stack of the writing that you've done i don't know sketches essays when people ask you for a packet you need to be ready you can be like oh i can write you up a packet or i can send you this one it's ready to go right now. Do you want that? You need to be ready. So write a bunch of stuff so that you have something to stand on when you tell people you're good. Have that proof. That's perfect. You guys, Amber Ruffin, uh, Wanda Sykes has Ruffin on you. Get it? Like nothing. Okay, I won't Ooh, do it. Um, and That's pretty terrible. <laughs> I know it was a dad joke just to end this, this <laughs> empowering woman conversation. Uh, Amber, thanks so much. Yay!